I truly pray that this message is a challenge and a blessing to all that hear it for God's glory and no one else. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray by your spirit that, Lord, we would understand the challenges that we're in, but the help and the joy that we have in Christ. Lord, I pray for mothers not only in this building, but in places where they desire to truly serve you and be an example. I pray for all the ladies. Lord, truly in this nation, they are under attack by those who have feigned to be their friends. Lord, we're so glad that you are the friend that sticks closer than a brother. So Lord, I pray that you'd give us ears to hear and a heart to understand. Lord, I pray that you would help your tool, your servant, to be distinct. Lord, that the word that is spoken will be clear and of you. I pray this in our Savior's name. Amen. Now, I'd like for you, if you would please, bear with me in the next few minutes. You think, what in the world does this have to do with the message? It actually has to do a lot. And what I'm going to be reading to you, because I, I, I'm not reading it to you because it's political. It's not. But please just hear me out. In this day and age, there's a whole lot that could be said in this time. There was a speech that was made about a hundred years ago, spoken by a man by the name of Vladimir Lenin. In that speech, he laid out a plan for the destruction of America. Now, please, again, hear me out. These five next points were included in that plan. See, to him, he made the statement to the people that America was the only thing that stood in between them and communist domination of the world. Five of the points were these. Number one, destroy their, America, destroy their faith in God. That means we need to infiltrate the seminaries, the Bible colleges, we need to infiltrate the churches, the church organizations, and corrupt them. Destroy the family unit. Why? Strong families will not be easily subdued. Number three, destroy the education system. See, at that time, America, even in its simplicity, was among the most educated people in the world, the average American. So they said, destroy it. Number four, destroy the news media. They know too much. I remember reading of farmers a hundred plus years ago. You could go to their farm, talk to them about their freedoms, about their nation, and some of them would actually have a little booklet, a constitution with them. That got to be something that was kind of passe, sadly. Number five, and this is an exact quote, translated from Russian, but this is an exact quote. Our final formula for victory will be external encirclement and internal demoralization until that last great stronghold of capitalism drops into our hands like a ripe fruit. Now listen, no one would argue 
that the American family is under attack. There are other places that are under attack. The reason why I bring this up is we might feel powerless when it comes to what's going on in Washington, D.C., in the state capitol, even here. We might feel powerless about what's going on when it comes to the, um, the media, et cetera. But every one of us, ladies, listen, every one of us can stand in the middle of our homes and say with Joshua, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which are your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You've got the power right there. Somebody say amen, please. Amen. It's the truth. Amen. We can say it here in this building within these four walls. We will serve the Lord. Amen. Here's our challenge. We have an attitude either of apathy or We've just absolutely surrendered. That is not the way to go. Now listen, this nation is as strong as its families. Is the family strong today? No, not at all. There's confusion. And if you go against the grain, boy, will they go after you gender confusion, excuse me, God made them male and female. That's it. Rebellion against the God-given family. So what we look at this morning is the story about a woman. It took place in 895 BC. And here was a woman that had strength. And she tells us something. But in this story, there are three questions that are asked of her. As I was going through commentators, it was amazing to me how really none of them stopped to consider what was being asked. Oh, they made comment about it a little bit, but in the questions, there is much for us to consider. Ladies, there is much for you to consider. But for all of us, it is there. Before we get into it, let me just get at it somewhat. Well, no, let's go ahead and read the first several verses. Look at verse 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. This woman is said to have been the sister of Abishag, the Shunammite, well known in the history of David, and we're not going to get into that. Apparently she was a woman of influence, knew how to keep her house. The Lord allowed her to be wealthy, but she wasn't stingy. Shunem was about 20 miles northwest of Abel Mehola, Elisha's hometown. 25 miles or so beyond Shunem was Mount Carmel. I remember when my wife and I were there in Israel and we were standing on Mount Carmel, and the guide that was with us, Arie, he pointed, the, the Mediterranean is right behind us, so we're looking due east, and he pointed over here, and you could look and barely see it, but there it was, across the valley, there was the town of Shunem. The average traveler at that time on foot could cover between 15 to 20 miles per day. So Shunem was a good halfway point for Elisha. Whenever he left to go to 
Mount Carmel to pray or meet with others, whatever. Since Mount Carmel was a very special place because of Elijah's ministry, there could have been a school of the prophets there. But again, that's an aside. The Bible says that she constrained him to eat bread. She, it, it literally means she grabbed him, stopped him, and urged him, listen, stay here. Have a meal with us. The word constrained is in the imperfect tense, which means that she continually did this. He would walk by, she would go out, she'd grab and say, listen, you need to stop here. And so he got into the habit of stopping there. Now look at verse nine, look at verse nine. And she said unto her husband, behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick, and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in hither. That's where we get the phrase, a prophet's chamber. Verse 11, and it fell on a day that he came in thither and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. So here was a woman, she was wealthy, but she had a satisfied heart. She wasn't looking to grab more. Look at verse 13. And he said unto her, say now unto her, behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. In other words, you know what? God is more than enough for me. I'm doing fine, no problem. But there was something. Verse 14, and he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. So she was wealthy, she was content, but she had no child. Look at verse 15. And he said, call her. And when he'd called her, he stood in the door. She stood in the door. And he said, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived <coughs> and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. It was the time of harvest. He went out, it's warm. His dad is busy. His attention is to what they have been working at all year, but the son wanted to come out. Verse 19, and he said unto his father, my head, my head. And he said to a lad, carry him to his mother. I don't know if he had sunstroke, whatever. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon, and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called her husband and said, send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither the new, new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, it shall be well. Then she saddled an ass, said to her servant, drive, go forward, slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So you recognize there in Shunem, He's up on Mount Carmel. They've got a full day of travel, but they're gonna make it as quick as possible. So she went and came to the man of God, verse 25, to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi, his servant, behold, yonder is that Shunammite. 
Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? Well, she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to to thrust her away. The man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. The Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, take my staff in thine hand, go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. She said, No, 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 not your servant. You're coming. And Gehazi passed on before them, laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awakened. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. And he went in therewith and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned, walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in, fell at his feet, bowed herself to the ground, took up her son, and went out. There's a lot that we could go to when it comes to the story. But those three questions that the prophet asked of the lady are captivating. We're going to those. And I want to ask you, do what you can to put yourself in the situation, especially the ladies here, all ladies here. It's not just mothers. And let's stop and consider, and by the way, guys, there's stuff here for us as well. Let's hear while the ladies are hearing. Let me tell you, let me show you, I should say, what I mean. Look at the first question back at verse 26. Remember, this is the verse. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her. This is verse 26. And say unto her, is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? First of all, is it well with thee, speaking directly to the lady. It's fascinating here. The word well in the Hebrew can mean three things. Three things. Number one, is it well with thee physically? Now, ladies, that's a good question. You know, with everything that you do and what you're involved in, Those of you that have children, you know the body can take a beating. How many of you have ever had sleepless nights because of that or other things? Raise your hand. I'm not going to, it's to the ladies. So you stop and consider there's that difficulty. You know, sometimes because of sin in the family, the situation can really affect the lady. I believe that my sister died an early death because of the sin of her husband. I'm not going to go into it. The Lord has dealt with that. 
But there's times the pressure can do things to your body. Then secondly, financially. Is it well with you? Are, are you doing okay financially? Women love security. And security often, humanly speaking, winds up meaning I'm looking at the bank account, I'm looking at savings, you know, where are we at? I want to feel secure. Now, a lot of us, we understand debt can be a killer to marriages. We know that. So he's asking, possibly, are you well financially? But then, to me, this one would be the one that the prophet would be emphasizing the most. Are you well emotionally? It literally means, do you have peace? Are you at peace? Now, there is something that we learn in the scripture that the greatest peace, the only peace that really matters comes through Jesus Christ. Without salvation, there can be no peace of God. There are people, <coughs> excuse me, there are people today that are taking medications. We're, we, we've, we're, we're the most medicated people on earth. What are we looking for? We're looking for peace. Ladies, are you at peace in your heart? Now, I know, life can be so hectic. I mean, it just, children run all over the place. <laughs> Never forget, we got home from church. We're living in Santa Maria. Our daughter, Heather, she gets out of the car. We lived on a busy corner just off of a main roadway. And so we get out and we're getting stuff. And immediately, all of a sudden, we hear a horn honk. And we turn around. Heather has gotten on her tricycle and she's sitting in the middle of the street. And a car had to come to a screech and halt. I'm telling you, sometimes kids can drive you up a wall. Amen. All right. Life can be difficult when people look at you, and I'm talking to the ladies again, and they begin to judge you. You wonder if they're talking about you behind their back. And I am not belittling this because it can hurt. They wind up looking at you and wondering, you know, did you do something wrong in your life or et cetera? So much. You wind up feeling like you're being taken for granted, you're being compared all that. This is why we have the word of God, as I'll show you soon. Once there was an article in New York Times, they asked a group of women, a cl club women, to decide on the 12 greatest women in the United States. After due consideration, the editors of this organization replied, the 12 greatest women in the United States are women who have never been heard of outside their own houses. I can see that. I can see that. There is greatness in my wife that the world doesn't know about, but God knows. And there are ladies here that have been up to here in difficulty. But God knows. The writer of this article in the New York Times concluded this. He said, I ask you, who was greater, Thomas Edison or his mother? When he was a young lad, his teacher sent him home with a note that said this, your child is dumb. We can't do anything with him. Mrs. Edison wrote back, you do not understand my boy. I will teach him. 
we know what happened after that. The promises of God are paramount for any lady that is looking for the peace that passes all understanding. Please hear the following. Isaiah 26, 3, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Psalm 4, 8, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep for thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Psalm 46, 1, God, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Isaiah 41, 10, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. That's what our God does for ladies who are looking for peace. It comes through salvation in Jesus Christ. Psalm 55, 22, cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. Psalm 42, 11, why art thou cast down O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Finally, in John 14, 27, Jesus said this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now there's something that we're going to be uh, covering in a series that I'm working on, <laughs> two series away. One of the things that we wind up doing if we're not careful, and ladies, I'm talking specifically to you. One of the things we wind up doing is we pray and we beg God to give us something that he's already told us he's given us. In this case, it's peace. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. Those are the people that have trusted Christ. You don't have to beg God, you just have to simply stop and recognize you have it right now and then act accordingly. That's called stepping out in faith. I'm going to live as if I have recognized that this is what God has given me. And he will be there when you trust him. That's how you recognize this peace. The second question is it well <coughs> with thy husband? Now, for those of you that are married, understand the impact that you can have. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3, would you please? 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, there are issues that we deal with in this day and age that we struggle with simply because of the culture that has pressed upon us. Look at verse one. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Wait a minute, how can I be? Hey, again, I love my wife. I've told you umpteen times, that lady, is smarter than I am. She gets mad when I mention that. That's why I enjoy mentioning it. But now listen, when it comes to who's the head of the household, you're looking at him. 
because there can, there can only be one head of the household. Do I listen to her counsel? Absolutely. Any smart man would do that. For instance, when I was looking at that truck the other day, never mind. But I'm the head of the household. Ladies, when we operate by how God has created us, how he has set us in this life, we'll be a whole lot better off. But there are things that the husband needs to understand as well. But look again at that verse one. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they're not listening to the word of God. They also may without the word be won by the conversation or the manner of life of the wives. To me, one of the greatest examples of this is a dear friend of mine who's now with the Lord. He was here many times. Some of you don't know him. Some of you, I, I believe you will remember him. And that's evangelist Chuck Cofty. Chuck Cofty was 22 years in the Marine Corps. And uh, I mean, he was in some incredible stuff. His wife, one day, trusted Christ at a church service. She got saved. He was absolutely infuriated. I mean, he cussed her out. He said, I'm not gonna be married to some holy roller and on and on and on and on. And she lived with that for two years, but she grew in Christ. Well, there was a day that came along. I, again, I've told you this story before. Chuck was part of those in the Marine Corps that were um, taking the POWs that came back from Vietnam and, and they were getting all the info from them, talking to them, writing down details and stuff and et cetera. It was driving him crazy because of what went on with our POWs and I'm not gonna get into that right now but he just, he just realized he couldn't go on. He just couldn't go on. He got into his uniform one morning and he was getting ready to go to see a psychiatrist knowing that if he went to see that psychiatrist, it was over. Not only was he done with what he was doing, he was out of the Marine Corps. That was it. He's walking to the door, he told me. When he got to the door, he heard his wife, Lenora, say, Honey, she had a thick Southern accent. You don't need a psychiatrist. You need Jesus. She took him, sat him down on the sofa, and because of the life that she had lived for two years before him, sat him down, took the Bible, and led Chuck Coffey to Christ. The Lord just took off with him after that but it was because of the life that Lenora lived. Now, when it comes to the lady that is in this situation, it seems that the husband didn't care all that much. What, what, are, you, what are you talking about? It's not, he was basically saying, it's not time to go to church. You know, there's a, it's not the new moon, it's not the Sabbath, you know what? Just take him. He's busy with what he's doing. Do you know something? She never belittled him. There was nothing that was listed in that. Men, we need to understand something. The women in our lives need us to hear him. He didn't. We can. Let me give you a for instance. 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. I got to realizing this. If my prayers for this church are not gonna be hindered, I need to make sure I'm getting along with that lady. I need to be getting along with that lady or I might as well quit what I'm doing. 
Guys, it's stunning to me how we think we can treat ladies badly and then think God is going to bless us. And sometimes Satan comes along and makes it look like we're being blessed and we think we're getting away with it. No, we're not. No, we're not. You know what we ought to do, guys? We ought to make it so that the ladies, when they, at, when they hear this question, is it well with thy husband, they smile. Yeah, he's doing all right. And if you don't have a husband, you've got a dad, you've got a brother, you've got brothers in Christ. Just look around. By the way, ladies, do you know that you need to be praying for us guys? I have opened the door wide open for you. Let's, let's put it this way. Let's see how you respond to this. How many of you would say amen to this? Boy, do the men in this church need prayer. Amen. Ephesians 5, husbands, now listen. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Question, how much did Christ love the church? He bears the scars forever. Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? And then thirdly and lastly, is it well with the child? Over 100 years ago, G.K. Chesterton asked this, can anyone tell me two things more vital to the race than these? What man shall marry what woman and what shall be the first things taught to their first child? Now, obviously we know to know Christ, but he makes a good point here. Chesterton goes on to comment that this, the natural operation surrounding, surrounded her the mother, with very young children who require to be taught not so much anything, but everything. Babies need not be taught a trade, but be introduced to a world. To put the matter shortly, a woman is generally shut up in a house with a human being at the time when he asks all the questions that there are, and some that there aren't, our race has thought it worthwhile to cast this burden on women in order to keep common sense in the world. No, God ordained it. But again, it makes a good point. And there are women that don't have their own children, but they make an impact on others. We need to see the importance of this. Proverbs 1.8, my son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. The world, they need to know, children, is the spiritual realm first and foremost. Every person ever born, everybody that's in this room, Everyone will live somewhere forever. The thing that people need to be taught, the thing that babies need to be taught, little ones need to be taught, is about Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. That's why even, it's even good for us to sing about Jesus loves even me. Those simple songs that we used to sing a long time ago. Jesus loves me, this I know. Little ones to him belong. Can you imagine what a child is taught about Jesus just in those words? I've shared this before. I'm gonna share it again. It breaks my heart every time. The most vulnerable 
victims of family instability are the children who are too young to understand what has happened to their parents. That tragic impact on the next generation was graphically illustrated to me in a recent conversation with a sixth grade teacher in an upper middle class California city. She was shocked to see the results of a creative writing task assigned to her students. They were asked to complete a sentence that began with the words, I wish, I wish. The teacher expected the boys and girls to express wishes for bicycle or dogs or, or you know, television set, trips to Hawaii, whatever. Instead, 20 of the 30 children made reference in their responses to their own families that were disintegrating. These are a few of their actual responses. I wish. I wish my parents wouldn't fight, and I wish my father would come back. I wish my mother didn't have a boyfriend. I wish I could get straight A's so my father would love me. I wish I had one mom and one dad so the kids wouldn't make fun of me. I have three moms and three dads and they botch up my life. I wish I had an M1 rifle so I could shoot those who make fun of me. Mom, you can preach. Preach it. Proverbs 31.1, the words of King Lemuel, another word for Solomon, the prophecy that his mother taught him, the prophecy, the forth telling, she was preaching. When Robert Ingersoll, the notorious skeptic, was in his heyday, two college students went to hear him lecture. As they walked down the street after the lecture, one said to the other, well, I guess he knocked the props out from under Christianity, didn't he? The other said, no, I don't think he did. Ingersoll did not explain my mother's life. And until he can explain my mother's life, I will stand by my mother's God. If you, don't, if you don't remember anything else from this message, ladies especially, would you please remember these two things that I give you and we're done. Number one, let the God of heaven define you. Let the God of heaven define you. Back to Proverbs 31, but this is verse 30. Favor how you act is deceitful, and beauty, how you look, is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Let the God of heaven define you. Number two, let the God of heaven direct you. I, uh, a couple, three weeks ago, I got to remembering a verse that had come to me when I was seeking God's will in my life. And I remember, I, it, just, it just came. All of a sudden I remembered a phrase from Abraham's servant back in the book of Genesis, Genesis 24. I being in the way the Lord led me. I went back and I studied it greatly just a couple of weeks ago. And looking at the servant, I recognize this. You know, if you're looking for God to direct you, you need to walk like his servant did in the way of obedience, in the way of faithfulness, in the way of prayer. In the way of obedience, in the way of faithfulness, in the way of prayer. As a woman, however else you are, a, a, a spouse, a mother, a grandmother, whatever. 
Let God direct you, taking this book, rightly dividing the word of truth, obey it, be faithful to it, pray over it. But I do ask you, is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child?